Hi, I'm John, welcome to The Gun Shop, and today we have some guests. Uh, this is Nick, and this is Alan, and they're going to introduce themselves to you. Uh, I'm Nick Horton, I'm the chairman of the Langston Wildfowlers. <clears throat> um, I'm Alan Musselwhite, I'm the vice chairman of Langston Wildfowlers, and we're both punt gunners. And as you can see, they brought us a punt gun, um, which is awesome. And I'm going to let them talk about it for a bit. But if we if we start at the uh, at the blunt end um, and begin with a bit of the technical history, this is an inch and a quarter muzzle loader. Uh, under this paintwork, it's got a Damascus barrel, which is in surprisingly good condition. The gun was built in about 18 1853 ish. 1853-ish. Um, it was actually one of a number of guns um, that was built under the supervision of Colonel Hawker um, from Lymington, who was one of the uh, so-called fathers of, of wild fowling. Um, and it's got quite an interesting history. It was made by uh, Clayton of Lymington, who is or was uh, one of the leading punt gun manufacturers of the day, who built punt guns um, which were extremely good technically. Um, some of the reasons were very technical, I won't bore you too much with them, but um, the gun itself as you can see um, it's got a conventional wooden stock that holds a percussion lock. Uh, it's a half cock lock fired by a trigger lanyard, there is no cap on that so I shall just drop it gently. This would have been undone and priming powder, fine grain powder would have been inserted by turning the gun onto its side, pouring the powder in there, screw that attachment back in. Do you use black or black substitute? Black, the, the real McCoy, not, not Pyrodex. Um, and when you fire it you get a, a gentle ignition from the percussion cap of the fine grain powder which then shoots the flame across the base of the, um, of the black powder charge which is about what, two ounces in this gun? Two and a quarter ounces in that gun. Two and a quarter ounces. Um, that sets off obviously the, uh, the the chain reaction. The powder burns. The shot shoots out the end of the barrel. In a minute, we'll come on to um, some of the technical aspects of the uh, of the charge itself. Um, it's probably punting the shot out at about how many feet per second? You reckon about twelve hundred? About twelve hundred foot per second. Yeah, that's yeah. fast. It's quite. It is surprisingly that is fast. Substantial. Yeah, actually. twelve hundred feet per second. Um, they, they've, Another long story short, um, Basque did some uh, research on punt guns some years ago and everybody was actually surprised at what the muzzle velocities were. I was expecting that touching 950. a thousand, yeah. Yeah, 850, 900, but no, it's... 1200's a... It's, it's, a it, it's up there. It's a, a low-end pigeon cartridge, isn't it? That's, exactly. That's impressive. Yes. So, um, I'm sure I've missed out all sorts of things, but the gun is breached with uh, an underbarrel loop. Um, Many of you who are familiar with punt guns often see guns with trunnions on the side. This is a far more mechanically uh, efficient way of, uh, of breaching a punt gun. But it looks, um, looks like a cannon. It looks less like a cannon. Um, the, 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 the real science, if you like, is in, in the rope breaching. This knot doesn't look very seaman-like, um, uh, arranged as it is at the moment. But the, the long and short of it is when you fire the gun, a lot of the recoil is dissipated by this knot. So on firing you might expect a little bit of a bump at the muzzle, she'd, she'd lift off of the rests, um, but the stories that you might have heard about the gun leaping up in the air and the punt recoiling back yards through the water in a properly uh, rigged punt is a complete nonsense, it doesn't happen. Um, most of the recoil is lost when the gun is fired. Um, so that's that's kind of the gun in a nutshell. That's mostly because it weighs how much? Well, it weighs about a hundred pound. Um, so obviously you need a certain amount of ordnance to fire a certain amount of yeah. shot, and there, there is a ratio, and I can't think of it off the top of it. But no, ninety-six it's, to one. It's ninety-six yeah. to one. Yeah. That's how we used to um, develop shotguns, isn't it? Mm. It basically, um, as we say, a hundred pound. It will fire a pound of shot. So there you go. It works out exactly the right ratio. But it shoots better with twelve to fourteen ounces, and again, that's only through you know, trial and error. It to find out how it shoots and where it shoots best and what it shoots best with. In interestingly, this gun, because of its age, um, and it was uh, it was built by someone who started gun making with flintlocks, um, and, and certainly covered the, the early development stage of the, uh, of the percussion gun. Most later muzzle-loading punt guns are just a, a straight 
tube internally. This one is relief board. It's slightly wider in the chamber, or what passes for the chamber in, uh, in a muzzle loader. Then it's slightly tighter until about three feet from the bore, where for a, again about a foot it opens out fractionally before constricting again at the muzzle. Um, and what that does is it, 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 it enables the pressure in the gun to build to its maximum and it even imparts the equivalent of a degree of choke on the shot as it flies out the end of the barrel. You were, you were stating it was about 5 foot or 60 yards which I thought was unbelievable in terms of like if compactness. Somebody, yeah, if yeah. somebody could make a 12 ball like that we'd be uh, in for some serious money. Well in, indeed yes but that's that's down in, in the main to, to the quantity the, of shot. And the 11 foot barrel. And, and, the, and, and the very long barrel yes. Um, it, 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 carrying this, it's definitely a two-man job, and, and as we get older, the, the less distance we've got to carry it to put it on the punt, the better we like it. And is all punting done as a two-man team, or is there such a thing as a single-man punt There's, gun? There are, there are single-handed outfits. Um, Double-handed outfits are possibly more um, more popular because a you can go with someone, you've got a bit of company, you've got you've got uh, the, the the safety aspect of it. There's a tremendous amount of work involved, which yeah. if you can split between two people, oh, makes certainly. it makes it that, um, that that much more enjoyable. Um, and if you and with two of you, if you can split the costs of the thing as well, um, because the cost of a punting outfit, which is the gun, the the punt, and all the ancillary equipment, would probably run on on a bad day to about ten thousand pounds worth. If you wanted to, if you were. start from scratch. Okay. So, uh, for example, how much is this gun worth? What's this gun worth? Well, what it's it's probably worth between seven and ten thousand, because of its because of its provenance. Yeah. yeah. Um, you could actually make a punt gun, not like this, but a adequate a, an, an adequate gun for about fifteen hundred quid. That's not too bad, um, really. If, if you think about the actual cost there. That's oh yeah, I mean, a, a, a silver pigeon, isn't it? That's exactly. Yeah. And if you if you got, got a lot of gun for your money. If, certainly, if you've got access to your own lathe, which which many people have, a big lathe, a big one, um, then obviously the, the the cost would decrease. You, you're probably looking at about a thousand pound for a boat trailer, and the punt, of course, which which is not here, um, is is another. Depending on how you start, if you've got a pile of plywood, it's the cost of the plywood and your time. You said you built your plot of yours. Oh, built mine. How so long did it take? It took me about four weeks of evenings and weekends, but it's not too I'm, bad. I'm a carpenter by trade, well, so you that, have that an unfair advantage. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it, 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 and the other thing is, 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 is finding the plans. You can find all sorts of plans written, but you want something that you know is tried and tested. And I was quite lucky. I am. Um, I knew what I wanted. I knew the design I wanted. Um, thanks to Nick and some of the photographs that, that Nick had had, we built something that was traditional to our area because punts are very much uh, traditional to yeah. an area. Um, the East Coast punts, for argument's sake, wouldn't have. We have outriggers to row with. They have straight um, pins and, and, and rollocks. And um, yeah, certain differences to, to areas, are, are, and there are a lot of borders. But then they do a lot of more open sea work than we we tend to do as coastal sort of estuaries. Yeah. Whereas, you know, your Frank say on the Wash, it's a big, big water plane. So that, you know, they need a certain um, stabler boat and bigger boat for them particular areas. So I think it's. Um, How long is the punt? Are your punt? Well, I've got one that's 18 foot, one that's 22 foot, one that's 21 foot, and one that's 24 foot. A lot bigger than I thought they'd be. Yeah, they're very, very large. I suppose if two men lying down in it, it's going to need the, to be... The, the, two, the 22 and the 24, they're both double punts. The um, seven, I think seven, 18 foot, actually, the single yeah. one. 18 foot single, and uh, the, the 20 foot single, which is a large single stroke small double. Um, it's uh, They both, all of them... Have been refurbed, caught, brought back from the brink of firewood, yeah. and now are restored to such an extent. And if you go onto the um, Langston Wildfowlers website, there is actually a whole section on restoring uh, the, the one of the punts from literally from pile of firewood to something that is usable. So very good. If for a minute we've we've talked about the blunt end, if we go up to the sharp end, do you want to just have a chat through the contents of the magazine. Yeah, this is uh, a conventional punk gun magazine. Um, it's basically different compartments. It's a wooden box. Um, it has powder charges, shot charges. Um, that is a powder charge. That's three ounces of powder. 
are just coarse grey and black. It's yeah. actually blasting powder in that one. Okay. Uh, I'll give that back in that case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is um, as a pounder number threes. This is this is for uh, that uh, charges for another gun. It's not this particular gun. Uh, presuming that we can't use lead, what do you use? Tungsten. We use ITM um, for the shotgun uh, for the punk gun charges. And, and to be and you just put that in as is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And basically, what would happen is the powder charge would be pushed down the barrel to the end and rammed. And the old adage: ram your powder and not your shot, because it creates excessive pressure. So you ram your powder. You have on here a pricker, and it's, it's a silver solder stick because it's basically, it doesn't ignite with metal to metal, which you could do with black powder. So you're not going to spark it. And exactly, and so you, you then prick the bag through the priming chamber, so the bag's all open, you fill the priming chamber, as Nick described earlier on, with fine powder, tighten the, the, uh, the nut up, put the cap on. All before you go out. All before you go out. Generally, it will stay low, it will be loaded on the day we're going out. So you basically powder charge, your wadding, which is an ounce of oakum, which I use three ounces of black powder and an inch and a half gun, an ounce of oakum and a pound of shot. In this particular gun it will be two and a quarter ounces of powder, exactly the same method, ounce of oakum and 12 to 14 ounces of shot. And it's one shot per trip? Usually. Usually. We can reload. We can reload a float. In just in shallow water? Or... Literally any water, because you can turn the gun round on the gun crutch and you can clean, wipe the gun out. You have a long um, clean rod stroke ramrod. Um, unfortunately we didn't bring it today because it wouldn't fit in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Generally it goes to the bottom of the punt. Um, you know, you'd wipe it out because it leaves a watery residue, black powder is very corrosive. There's watery residue, you wipe it out, you could then reload by turning the, the gun around on the gun crutch and doing it in the punt. We don't, we generally go aground, wipe it out, and leave it in the punt, one of us will stay in the punt, the other one will load it up if we're going to reload and if there's another shot to be had but generally speaking that would only happen if we've uh, we've had a miss or it hasn't been a particularly good shot or there's an abundance of birds so you know it, you sort of play it by ear downside to it is if you've loaded it and you don't take another shot you've got two choices you can unload it with a worm on the end on the cardboard and draw the charges which isn't always efficient or you leave it loaded till you go out next time once the stock and the action's off. All it is is a tube with a charge in it. It's, it's not, you know, it's not unsafe. It's it's completely safe. It's no different to having the charge there, really. Is it? Exactly. It's exactly the same thing. All the time, there's no me mechanism on it to fire it. I'm not saying that's what we do. We would try our hardest to, obviously, if we're going to load it to, to fire. It. And and nine times out of ten, if it had been the back end of the season, I wouldn't leave it loaded over over the um, summer period. It would no. be discharged, yeah, regardless well, of the sort of If you're going out that evening or the next morning, it's, yeah. it's not unsafe, just take your lot I mean, it, had, had it been that we'd done, um, we'd had a shot, for, or, or we didn't have, we loaded it, didn't have a shot, but we knew the shot would, there was a shot to be had at a later stage, it would stay loaded. Uh, it's all kept in the same place, there would be no breech plug on it, all the charge would be there, nothing in, in any way, shape, or form, so it could be fired. We put it together when we go out ready to, to fire the next time and it, it works extremely well you could unload it but you end up wasting more than you actually and when you're talking every time you fire a pound a shot about 30 quid depending on how you buy it can be as much as 40 pound because it depends if you if it's available or whether um you know what price you buy that because right. it really does and we don't use steel because well other people with um Access to more modern guns. I mean, this, this is a this is. Oh, you wouldn't a for a Damascus gun, so, would you? Know? So no, we, we definitely wouldn't with this one. Um, other people have exper experimented quite successfully with yeah. steel, uh, um, and I say we. Alan's got a gun um, uh, that that we'd look to use steel through, uh, and indeed, as he was saying earlier, he's just completed making a, a double-barreled gun, which was specifically made for use with steel. The other thing, as well, is if as, as when any. Um, the, the barrel's made out of a carbon hollow bar, which is extremely hard. So if you were to use something like a mylar wrap or a plastic wrap, you you doing exactly the same as you would with a with a steel proof shotgun. You know, it's protecting the shot against the barrel. Yeah. Um, I think what you'd have to do, we intend to do some trials with it this um, this year. Up until now, we just haven't had the opportunity. The weather's never been particularly conducive for us to uh, to try it. So. 
But yeah, <coughs> that is the intention. Uh, myself and another chap, we built the gun between us, um, and with with the intention of, of say using still trying to use still shot. And I know someone in Scotland has had very good success with it. So and this myth is just. B it's Bismuth, more or less the same price as tungsten and not as good, I suppose. It's, well, yeah, I mean, bismuth actually works very well. Like, like everything else, sadly, with, with involving non-toxic shot, <clears throat> it's very often the cost factor that is that is limiting. Yeah. If you can get steel to work, which which I, I, I certainly think is, is is has been proved to be um, perfectly feasible and 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 with no uh, barrel damage. Then that's probably the way to go. This 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 particular gun, I think, will be retired at that point um, when when the ITM runs out. But um, yeah, a, a punk gunning is 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 not quite dead in the water. Which is a terrible pun, but I enjoyed it. Yes. <laughs> um, all right, target species. Um, uh, again, in its in its heyday when punk gunning was first developed. Which was when? Um, the, the the first. Uh, the description of, a, of what we would call a true punt gun, a gun that looks something like this in a punt that you would recognise as a very, punt. Very quick interruption because I'll forget this question otherwise. What is the smallest punt you can get? You can... A punt gun? In, 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 I suppose in technical terms you would go from a big shoulder gun like an 8 or a 4 bore. So 4 um, bore is probably... 4 bore is roughly an inch but of course an inch bore punt gun is 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 able to fire a larger charge than a four bore yeah. because of the extra weight of material. Um, inch bore guns were quite popular because they were relatively small, relatively portable, economical to use. There's your one man team and, gun. And, and as a, if you're a one man band, then um, uh, uh, then an inch bore gun would probably have been what you'd have looked at because apart from anything else, you wouldn't constantly be giving yourself a hernia every time you tried to move it. Um, Sorry for interrupting. Not Come at all. Except that at my age, I frequently lose the plot about what I was talking about previously, which was what were quarry species. Oh, quarry species. Um, 1799 in Chichester Harbour is probably the earliest reference to um, true punt gunning. People often think that punt gunning was developed on the east coast. It wasn't. They, we'd been punt gunning here for 20 years before they ever. Sounds like some minor animosity going uh, on there. No, not at all. No, we get on like a house on fire. So. Um, the, the, the quarry species in those days would have been anything that had feathers on it at any time of the year. There was no legislation that prevented what was shot and when it was shot. There were no seasons, no nothing. Um, everything from seagulls, shell duck, dunlin, up to the more traditional quarry species of duck and geese. They were all made of meat um, and they all uh, fetched a very good price on the market. Um, uh, the, the, the records of that particular early punt gunner suggest that his income over uh, his first few years of operation was £80. Now, 80 quid in 1799 had the, the, the purchasing power, if you like, in today's monetary terms, of about £150,000. And don't we all wish game was worth that much money? And sadly, uh, it, it isn't. But, you know, come forward, that's part of 200 years to, to the modern, to the present day, um, and you are limited to uh, mallard, widgeon, pintail, teal, gadwall, what have I missed? Golden. Shoveler. Shoveler. Um, you wouldn't normally, you can shoot golden eye, but you wouldn't normally shoot them with a punt gun because they'd, they'd be diving duck. But one of the problems with any of the diving species, which are, which are lawful quarry, is they, particularly in, in days of a, punt, of, a, of a flintlock gun, but still today, their natural reaction is not to spring out of the water, their natural reaction is to dive. So they'll duck the flash, they'll, they'll see the flash, they'll see the smoke, and by the time the shot gets there, they're underwater. I presume there's some, but there's going to be a delay, but what we're talking, a second? Mill milliseconds, but you do, you get a bit of a puff of smoke out of the back They've end. They've got quick reaction, and don't they? Anything that's not right, and under they go. But with, uh, with the other quarry species, um, which includes, of course, the geese, Canada geese, pink-footed geese, and grey lag geese, um, however many that is, if you if you add them all up together, um, it's more than enough to be getting on with. Oh, I think the, 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 the principal species that yeah, most punk gunners are after, and um, probably widgeon, that's where, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, you, you do get pinto, you do get mallard, you do get all the other species, in teal, but pr uh, principally it is widgeon, widgeon and teal mainly that we, mm. that we target, only because mallard don't sit particularly well, pinto can be a bit skittish, um, whether the uh, certainly the teal and the widgeon 
that seem to be more approachable and that there are bigger rafts of them as opposed to you don't get a big we don't get big rafts of mallow down here we get a few must be area specific then yeah yes. i mean and certainly again up on the east coast they get quite big sittings of mallow they get quite big sittings of other ducks but we don't and again um, over in wells uh, on the in the welsh on the welsh uh, estuaries they get a lot of pintail nowhere near what we get and uh, a lot more than what we get here so yeah i think it is it is so it's specific but generally speaking the principal quarry will be widgeon until yeah, for us now, mm. but uh, as Nick said, at any time when there was no legislation, what wasn't sold for meat would be sold for specimens for ta taxidermy and things like that. So there was there was no seasons, and so yeah, basically anything sort of went. There was a lot more duck around then, though. There's a lot more game no. around generally, or not really. No, no, quite the reverse. In point of fact, it's interesting you 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 mentioned that there was often this assumption that that many many years ago there were huge numbers of birds. If you read the diaries of Colonel Hawker, who was a very keen punt gunner um, down at uh, Lymington and Keyhaven <coughs> in the early years of the 19th century, he talks about the clanging battalions, particularly of Brent geese, which was a quarry species in those days. But when you actually pin down what he's saying, he's talking at less than a thousand birds. Uh, often he, he, he generalises, but there are a couple of specific points where he mentions they've actually counted the birds. And it's and it's 900, 1,000. Nowadays, if you go down to the same part of the coast, Brent geese in particular, because we're talking about them, you'd see five or ten thousand oh, easily. Jesus, yeah. And and their and their the numbers around the coast um, have uh, have increased exponentially. Uh, even the common uh, quarry species are all doing extremely well. Which is good for hunt, Which, gunning, uh, I presume, I mean, and wildfowling generally. Well, exactly. It puts kind of wildfowling into into context in in that it is not something that has any ecological impact whatsoever. All the species that are quarry species are doing extremely well. Thank you very much. That's what we like to hear, right? Huh? Absolutely. How many do you shoot with it? I mean, obviously we hear stories of they go out <coughs> shooting 100 or 50 ducks at a time, but it's not really true from what you've been saying. No. Um, I think a lot of the problem is that you go back to the days when punt gunning was completely unrestricted. A punt gunner, uh, uh, in, in order to make money, might shoot into a stand of Dunlin, the, the very the, the small yeah. little wading shoreboat. Um, and you might pick up two, three hundred. The, the, the heaviest shot that I know of, of Dunlin was 36 dozen. So that's over 300. And shooting that with what, like sort of sixes, sevens, sevens. sevens. Yeah, in, in Portsmouth Harbour, behind, behind the a pound of sevens. The, yeah, literally a pound of sevens in a muzzle in a muzzle loading in, in an inch and three quarter muzzle loading gun behind the rifle butts on at um, at Titner was a was a favourite spot to to, to shoot uh, Dunlin. They were sold to the ships, uh, cooks that were the, the naval vessels that were moored in Portsmouth Harbour. They they, they picked the birds up. They'd either take them down to uh, McCreary's, the game dealers in Portsmouth, or they'd row them out to the ships and sell them to the cooks who would prepare them for the officers. They'd sell them as snipe at a penny each. Well, 36 dozen, whatever the number is, um, at a penny each in 1910 was two weeks' pay, basically. Good um, morning's work. So it was a good morning's work. Um, that, that was the, 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 the economics of it then. It's now been turned on its head. Um, you ask how many we shoot. We we had a run of shots of about 16 with this. Um, the the average is about eight, and that's a that's a figure that works out right across the right, board, so, all right. around the country. Yeah. Um, roughly eight, which is enough for own use, right? Exactly. The other thing, well, people think that you're going to go out and make a mass killing with a with a punt gun. As a shoulder gunner, I shoot probably ten times more with a shoulder gun than I do with a punt gun. Absolutely. A because you may well go out. Maybe 12 hours of float, you may not get a shot. If you do have a shot and you have a shot of eight, it's eight over that period of time, you may not go out for another two months. So, you know, it's I shoot a lot more with a shoulder gun, and I, I mean, I belong to um, three, three wildfowl clubs, and across them clubs, as I say, I shoot considerably more than I ever do with a punt gun, but I don't do it for the quantity of birds I shoot, I do it to keep some a tradition alive. That we, you know, we, our forefathers were, were still there, and certainly with, with my family, who were the founder members of Langston Wildfowlers, and who punted the arbour at different times. So, you know, it, from, from my point of view, it's quite a, a family it's history. Restrictions on where you can use them. 
Is it technically a shotgun? So you can use it like you would a shotgun? Or? It's technically a shotgun. Um, that gets a little bit complicated in the sense that um, what you can't do, but could do many years ago, would be, for instance, to roll up at your local estuary in your punt and gun, launch the thing and go shooting. You simply cannot do that now. There's, there are all sorts of restrictions on membership. There's all sorts of consents that you need from natural England to shoot in the first instance. So I suppose the simplest answer is that you need to belong to the Wild Fowling Club um, and, and, and the Wild Fowling Club needs the appropriate p permissions to conduct its, its activities. But as long as they encompass shooting with a shotgun, then you can punt. I think the only time that that alters is if you go to Scotland as a travelling punt gunner and because the laws are different in Scotland, I think there are some estuaries that you can pump because it's a recreational activity, the use of the foreshore mm -hmm. for, for wildfowling. So there are some, some, it's slightly different, it's something you really need to find out before you go. I mean, it's not the same, you wouldn't just take your gun out and go and have a look, no, would you? No, so it's no, much no, the same no. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, most places are controlled by local authorities. You, know, you have to so It's done on local yeah. rules more yeah. than and, anything yeah, else. It's, it's, it's very much, as we said right back at the beginning, it's kind of area specific. Um, but it is something that you can get into if if you. If that's, you that's the big overriding question, is it? How hard is it to get into it? It's well, funny enough. I, I know someone who's uh, in the process of building himself an outfit at the moment. Um, he's built himself a trailer. He's built a punt. Made a really nice job of it. Yeah. Um, he's just acquired a lathe, um, and he's he's, he's going to have a crack at, um, at at building the gun himself. And I, I'm sure he will build a completely serviceable outfit. Um, the, the cost, because he's doing it all himself, would be significantly lower than the top end figure that we that we mentioned previously. But because he really wants to do it, he's going to move heaven and earth. Part, part of the joy, I suppose, is that exactly. you can only go out half yes. a dozen times. Is, is there a restriction to how many times you can no, go out? No yeah. restriction on the number of it's times. How many times you can be bothered to load the trailer up, put it in the water, exactly. load your gun up? It, it is intensely physical mm. you you, uh, you know you go you get up in the morning you, you go flight shoot and you sit on the seawall or you walk out on the mud and you go home and, and go to work you know you, you've been out on a 12-hour punting trip you go home and go to bed because you would be absolutely dog tired at the end of it and finally on yeah. that subject yeah. the the most importantly i think is that um shoulder gun you can go and buy shooting lessons you can go and go to a clay ground and you can have 50, 100, you know, 200 clays to get your eye in. Um, and, and indeed, there are gun shops. There, there's, you can't go into a shop that sells punt guns. There's no, there's no punt gun in shop. Oh, I can see a hole in the market here. Every, every, everything that you need has to be made. And you've, mm -hmm. got, to, and you've got to know what you're making in the first instance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it will take you, on average, about 10 years of hard graft to become proficient with the complete outfit. Just to give you an example, yeah. an old fellow that he was one of the last punk gunners in our club prior to me and Nick, um, he, I took him out in the punt, he was 80 years old when I took him out in the punt, and I said to him, you know, there's a, a shot here, but he said, yeah, I'll, I'll push. I said, no, no, I'll, I'll do all the pushing. No, you sit behind the gun, 80 years old, and he pushed the punt like he was a 20 year old. He could turn the punt on the on the setting stick. He, the power on his forearms was exceptional. I took the shot. There was eight widgeon. I shot seven of them, and he moaned at me because I missed the eighth one. And he was 80 years old. I've never taken him out again. But, <laughs> but what he did actually show me, he showed me how to scull a punt. He said, "I'll show you once." He said, "I'm not showing you again. You'll have to learn after that." And he showed. And someone said to me, "How do you scull a punt?" I couldn't tell you. I can do it. But they'll say it's a figure of eight movement. It's loosely a figure, and it depends whether you start with the or the blade of the or vertical or horizontal. Some will do it one way, some will do it the other. And if you watch the gondoliers in um, the people on the gondoliers in uh, Venice, they scull a pump, they do it standing up, and they're sculling a pump along. You try doing it laying down, where you put the skull behind you. Oh, but you, that's a workout. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's, workout. it's quite unbelievable. And we've been out, crept across some deep channels. And, learn, and, uh, and uh, a couple of uh, stalks um, spring to mind, and one that, that he, Nick said at the time, probably one of the best stalks we've ever done. We had to get, nav navigate this channel, across this channel, around the corner, and all the birds were sat at the other side. We could see them, but we couldn't get to them, and we had to go all around this creek system, and it took us about an hour and a half to get around this bit, just without every so often stop. We did make the shot, and we made quite a nice shot, but just the time and effort that went into that shot was... So